really, I know that a lot of you are tired, um, but I would encourage you guys to use this time to your benefit, not because I'm speaking, but because this is an opportunity for you to grow, to reflect, to consider God's word, uh, and just like what you do now can set the stage for the rest of today, how you live today can set the stage for the rest of your life. And today we're going to move on, continue our story about David, kind of coming at it from a, a little bit of a different angle. And over the past few days, we've talked about David's great successes in the Lord. And there's so much that we can learn from his success, but there's also a great deal that we can learn from David's failures. And we need to learn these things. You know, yesterday we talked about how in the face of trials and temptations, he was able to follow the Lord, that when he was being attacked, when there were struggles, he was able to be faithful and confident in God's greatness. But the reality is that like all of us, he was far from perfect. I think this is illustrated pretty well in, in these two statements. I'm going to read them to you. You can look them up later. I'll share the references if you forget. The first is Psalm 27.4. It says, the one thing I ask of the Lord, the thing I seek most, is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, delighting in the Lord's perfections and meditating in his temple. Then there's an, another verse I'd like to read from 2 Samuel chapter 11, verse 4. And talking about David, it says, he sent messengers and said something like, go get Bathsheba and bring her to me so that I can sleep with her. You see a discrepancy going on here in the, the character and the life of David? That at one time he's saying, the only thing I want, all I want is God. And another point in his life, when he's in a different situation, he's wanting this sinful relationship. He's wanting to do something that he knows doesn't please the Lord. He's wanting to go against the confidence that he displayed earlier in God's word by just doing what he wants instead of what he knows God wants. And so we want to look at what happened. And for us to do that well, I think it would be great for us to like zoom out just a little bit and look at the verses, uh, look at the text surrounding the verses that, that I read earlier. So the first is from Psalm chapter 27. Starting in verse 1, it says, The Lord is my light and my salvation, so why should I be afraid? The Lord is my fortress, protecting me from danger, so why should I tremble? When evil people come to devour me, when my enemies and foes attack me, they will stumble and fall. Though a mighty army surrounds me, my heart will not be afraid. Even if I am attacked, I will remain confident. The one thing I ask of the Lord, the thing I seek most is to live in the house of the Lord all the days of my life, delighting in the Lord's perfections and meditating in his temple. For he will conceal me there when the troubles come, and he will hide me in his sanctuary, and he will place me out of reach on a high rock. And there we can see that David is valuing God because God rescues him in time of trouble. In 2 Samuel 11, starting in verse 2, it says, Late one afternoon... After his midday rest, David got out of bed and was walking on the roof of the palace. And as he looked out over the city, he noticed a woman of unusual beauty taking a bath. He sent someone to find out who she was, and he was told she is Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam and the wife of Uriah the Hittite. Then David sent messengers to get her, and when she came to the palace, he slept with her. And there's a lot going on here. And much has been said about both of these passages. They're, they're both incredibly well known. But there's at least one clear distinction going on in David's life. And that is in Psalm 27, he sees the need for God. Because God is rescuing David from very present trouble. In 2 Samuel 11, David is relaxing. And he's unable to see a single enemy out there. And this demonstrates an important reality for us. David really wanted to be close to God when he knew that he needed God. When David could see the enemy chasing him down, he needed God to rise up to protect him. When David understood that the enemy was setting traps for him, he needed God to be his guide in order to keep him safe. 
But when those enemies dissipated, so apparently did much of his desire to be close to the Lord, at least in the same way. He knew that his help comes from the Lord. But what happened when he didn't think he needed help anymore? And of course he was wrong in thinking that he didn't need God to rescue him. There was still an enemy out there. It wasn't that there was no one coming against him. He had just lost sight of the enemy. He couldn't see him. And oftentimes, what was true with him is true with us, that the most dangerous enemy for us is the enemy within. David's own pride and lust were not on his radar. There was no chance that he was going to fall into a Philistine trap. He could see that coming. He was aware of it. But he fell into a snare that has been laid out for all of mankind. Scripture tells us, Do not love the world nor the things that it offers you. For when you love the world, you do not have the love of the Father in you. For the world offers only a craving for physical pleasure, a craving for everything we see, and pride in our achievements and possessions. These are not from the Father, but are from this world. And this world is fading away, along with everything that people crave. But anyone who does what pleases God will live forever. We can see here uh, that, we, that David fell into a trap that has been set for all of our sinful hearts. The craving for the things of this world. That not all of our enemies are someone out there trying to get us, but often it's someone in here where we're most broken. And of course, we can recognize that, that this is something that every one of us deals with on a very real level. I'm confident that, that each one of us in here is aware uh, that we are not perfect people. In fact, I'll go so far to say that I'm fairly confident that those of us in here are aware that there are things in our life that are messed up that aren't how they should be. There are attitudes and practices and thoughts that are a part of our routines, that are a part of how we live, that we know come from this world and don't draw us closer to God. We're all inclined to want what this world has. We're all inclined to crave pleasure, and pleasure is not a bad thing. In fact, ultimately, God as our treasure gives us great satisfaction in himself. But if we live as if our own pleasure is what's most important, what we're saying is we are most important. And this is a significant pride issue. We are all our own worst enemy so often because of pride. We set ourselves up as God, as the most important person in our lives. Hard times come and we should be thankful because they humble us. And we see that we need help. We see that there's so much that we can't handle on our own. We see that we need God. But times of plenty and times of success often put us in a position to feed our pride. Often put us in a position to not think that we need God's help so much anymore. And for David, when he was hiding in a cave from his enemies, and he knew they were out to get him, God's palace looked so good, and he was able to say, like in, in Psalm 27, that what I really want is to be close to the Lord, because when I'm close to the Lord, He rescues me, and I'm secure. His need was clear, and he was thinking, oh, how wonderful it is to be in the house of the Lord, because He keeps me safe. But while David was in his own palace, the desire to be in God's house waned. It seemed redundant. Why, why would he want to be in the palace of the Lord when he was totally content, totally satisfied to bring pleasure to himself, to make much of himself in his own, in his own house, in his own palace? It seemed unnecessary to ask to be in the dwelling place of the Lord because he seemed to be getting the benefits without the person. And don't let your pride deceive you so quickly or so sneakily to think that this can't happen to you. It can, and for many of us, it has crept into our lives. Many of us want the things that God gives, 
without really wanting God. We want the protection, but we don't want the person. We want God's blessing, but we don't always want him to be close. Famous pastor John Piper said, People who would be happy in heaven if Christ were not there will not be there. The gospel is not a way to get people to heaven. It is a way to get people to God. It's a way of overcoming every obstacle to everlasting joy in God. If we don't want God above all things, we have not been converted by the gospel. Heaven and you want what God has to give you, but you don't want God himself, you are not a believer. You're not a follower of Christ. Those are hard words, but it's reality because the truth of what it is to be a Christian is not to be somebody who is good. It's not to be somebody who is better than somebody else when you compare your lives. It's not to be somebody who can pray and expect that God is going to just give you what you ask for. A Christian is somebody who is devoted to God because God did so much to reach out and start a relationship with you. And I'd like to ask you to kind of look inward. Would you be happy? Would you be happy if your life were perfect, but God was not there? Would you be happy in a world without pain, without struggle, without evil and tears, if the Lord was not present in your life? Would you be happy if you got everything that you wanted? Those skills, those relationships, that popularity, that money, that comfort, whatever it might be. Would you be happy if you got all those things but didn't have the Lord? Be honest. And if so, you have to con consider, really consider the question, do I actually love God or do, do I just love the idea that there's a God who's all-powerful to give me what I want? There's no substitute for God, and there's no good thing that compares with his presence. This week we've talked a lot about being close with God and just how valuable that is. There is nothing that compares with that. There is no satisfaction that competes with God's love. There is nothing worthwhile. There is nothing worthwhile. There is nothing worthwhile if God is not in it. This is his world. We are his people, and we were made for his presence. Listen to the good news of the gospel. God knows you. God sees you. God recognizes your need, and he stooped down so low to save you. He paid the ultimate price. And he has lifted you up in him if you have chosen to follow him. If your life has been given to him. When we were dead, he gave his life. When we were lost, he brought us home. And all of this can be summed up in the truth that he has given us himself. And if we are and we are rich if we have him but poor in every other area. But we are so impoverished if we have everything else but don't have God. Haven't you heard? What good is it for you if you get this whole world but lose your soul? How does a person lose their soul? They don't have it connected to the one who holds it. We recognize that God is more valuable, that he's more constant, that he's more faithful, that a relationship with him is more meaningful than everything else because everything else in life fails and fades away. No exceptions. He is our treasure. He is our treasure. And David... The mighty and wealthy king made himself so poor by trading closeness with God for something else that he thought would give him more pleasure or more meaning or something that he couldn't get out of his relationship with the Lord. 
He traded something of unlimited value for something that could never last. And he drifted from his closeness with God as he drifted towards sin. And I want to share with you guys something very significant. I want to share with you that David's sin right here was a result of his distance from God and not the other way around. David ended up being being stuck in sin because he was far away from God. Sometimes we feel like because we're sinning, we end up with this distance, this, this, this distance between us and God, and we just can't get close to him. But the reality is when we are living lives of sin, what's going on is the sin is, is a result, it's a symptom of us not being close. The truth is we have a God who has taken care of sin. Jesus paid the price completely. It has no power over us anymore. None. And when we're far away from God, when we drift from Him, when we don't rely on Him, when we don't dig in and remain close to the presence of the Lord, sin creeps in and takes over. And when David didn't prioritize closeness with God anymore, he fell fast and he fell hard. So for all of us who struggle with sin, yes, all All of us who struggle with sin, it's time for us to be real and recognize and consider what's going on in our life. It's okay for you to to consider, to look inside your mind, to look inside your heart, to identify the areas of your life where where you've been living in ways that, that don't honor the Lord. I'm talking to the person who loves to gossip. I'm talking to the liar. I'm talking to the secret porn watcher. I'm talking to the I'm so much better than you attitude person. I'm talking to the person who gets pleasure out of putting other people down or hating. I'm talking to the person who holds the grudges, who doesn't forgive. I'm talking to the person who cheats or who will do whatever they can to get their way. I'm talking to the manipulator. Ultimately, what I'm saying is I'm talking to me, and I'm talking to you, because we're all the same. Struggle with this issue of sin. And what we need is the power of the presence of God, because that is what will keep us from sin. When we are close to God, we are far from sin. Do you believe that? When you're close to God, you're far from sin. That's it. And it it sounds easy, and maybe it sounds too simple, but let me give you an example, uh, an illustration that might help you visualize how the presence of God can change the way that you live. All right, so you, you can imagine this scenario in your mind, and this is something that's so common, especially in, in our culture today, and the, the issue is the issue of pornography. So many people are engaged in this kind of, of sin, this kind of behavior behind closed doors, and it's, it's just a struggle for, for so many people, so many people. So imagine that this person is in their room, and they've been tempted to look at pornography, And we know that that it's a real struggle and it's really pulling on them and this person is a believer and they know that they shouldn't do it, but it's just just tempting, it's just tempting and they don't want to do the wrong thing, but they feel like they, they have to give in. So they pull out their technology, whatever it might be, and they're about to look up some, you know, some pornographic stuff and then that person's mom walks in. Do you think that person's going to still continue with their plan? You think they're going to be like, hey, mom, just stand right there. You know, I'm going to look at some stuff. Is that going to happen? No chance. It's, it's absolutely not going to happen. So what changed? The, present, the presence of that person's mom changed the entire scenario. Do you think that person stopped being a sinful person when their mom walked into the room? No. Do you think that person stopped having all their evil inclinations when their mom walked into the room? Absolutely not. Her presence, her presence changed things. 
doesn't free someone from all of the sinful desires, but the presence overcomes sinful desires. And don't we believe that God is more powerful than our parents? Parents are great, but don't you believe that the presence of God can be more significant than the presence of your mom? It can. When God is close, sin is far. When we come close to God, it operates so that we end up far away from sin. When we're in his presence, we are able to overcome. And like David, we are often closest to God when we recognize that we really, really, truly need him. So now we're back at the beginning, where we started. Looking at these two passages, uh, one where David said, the thing I want most is to be close to God, and one where David is saying, hey, servants, go get me that that woman because uh, I want something else. I want something more that I know doesn't please the Lord. Because we don't try to get close to him in that kind of situation. And when we're not close, sin reigns. So here's what I want you guys to remember today. You need God. Always. Always. We're one step from falling. Always. But God can be with you. As a follower of Christ, God is with you. Always. When times were good, David let his love for God grow cold. It led to disaster. It harmed his relationship with God and it damaged his family, and it hurt everyone, and things were never the same in his life after that. But what we're looking for is is a love that doesn't grow cold, but a love that grows old. One of the things that I'm really excited about in my life right now, uh, there's some transition things going on and a lot happening, but what I'm, one of the things that I'm really super excited about is my wife. Um... Because we've been married for about a year and a half, and it's great. And I'm excited that over time, I can get to know my wife better. I can learn to love her more. We can uh, experience things together. And over time, the love that, that will no longer be new will be replaced by something different. A love that is old. A love that is deep. A love that continues to develop and, and grows fuller. Like, like if you imagine a mighty tree, you know, with, with big branches, deep roots. Older means bigger. Older means deeper. Older means wider. Older means more. And it's so sad when we see Christians, when we see ourselves so excited to follow Christ when we first meet him. But then things, you know, kind of fade over time because the gospel becomes old. What a tragedy. When the gospel grows old, that should mean that it sinks in. That it becomes ingrained in who we are. That we can't even imagine living a single day, a single moment without the presence of God. Because we recognize that every moment is a gift from God. And that every good thing that we have in life is a gift from God. And every bit of who we are is because of God. And the salvation that we have and the promise of eternity is from God. How can we possibly live as if we don't need the presence of God in our lives? So hear me as I end. If you're a believer, you will be with God forever. And in eternity, you will not get tired of him. The more time you spend with God and the the older your relationship grows, the more meaningful it will be forever because he is the treasure of heaven. He will define your existence for all time. He is your reward. He is your hope. Can we not live like that now? How much more should we rely on God in a world characterized and broken by sin than we will when when we see him face to face and all things are made right? We need him. I need him. You need him. So let your love for God grow old 
But be so careful not to let it grow cold. Let God amaze you every day. Let the relationship you have with him deepen and blossom and build. You need him. So draw close. And like David, your life will go through different things. But if you are close to God, whether you are hiding in a cave from your enemies or whether you are relaxing on a rooftop, if you are close to God, you will be far from sin. And if you are far from sin, oh, how great it will be. But don't let us think that that's the ultimate reward. We're not living for purity. We're living for closeness with the God who gives that to us. Don't try to live a moment without God. Because whether you know it or not, you need him. Let's pray. God, we do need you. We, God, we, are, we just want to confess that today. We, who are so often think we have things under control and who so often rely on our own strength. God, help us to see how ridiculous the lie is that we could ever live life without you. But more than that, God, let us see just how wonderful, how magnificent, how great you are. We want you to be our treasure. We want you to be our pleasure. We want to find everything that we find meaningful in you. God, draw us close. Let us be defined as people who are always near to you. It's so sad that in our, our culture that we've allowed Christians to be characterized as, as people who just don't do this and don't do that. rather than people who are just so amazed by the reality of the gospel that changes our hearts, changes our lives, and changes who we are. Don't let us be people who go one moment wanting what you can give us rather than wanting who you are. If there are things in our life that need to go so you can shape us, God, strip those things away. And if there are things that need to come in, God, bring those things in. Because more than we want comfort, more than we want success, more than we want popularity or anything else, God, we want to be close to you. We want to be close to you. It's in Jesus' name that we pray together. Amen. Thank you all so much.